Good morning, Governor. You have decided on 150 billion this morning in terms of the QE that you are going to add. The market was expecting 100. Why the bigger number? Well, I think we've learned this year um, from our experiences uh, with earlier bouts of uh, COVID that it's important that we act both quickly and that we do act clearly in scale. And that was an important consideration for us. The second thing is that, of course, we have to meet the inflation target sustainably over time. So a lot of the work we did on our forecast and then applying the, you know, the prospective policy decisions into it, it was clear to us that actually we, you know, 150 was, 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 was a quantum of QE that delivered a sustainable uh, path of inflation to meet the target. What is the economic effect difference between the two numbers? Well, it's obviously, I mean, it's larger, obviously. Yep. Uh, and and I, th I think it really works through two ways. One, of course, is that it does have an impact on the cost of financing and on, on, the, on the curve, the interest rate curve. And, and secondly, obviously, there's a quantity effect, if you like, which is, um, you know, it puts, it puts more liquidity into the economy. It, 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 takes, it takes out assets that are not as liquid and puts assets into the economy that can be used in consumption and investment. In terms of what comes next, is QE still the most effective measure of delivering monetary stimulus to the economy after this announcement? Have you discussed other tools, for instance, yield curve control? And do you have an idea in terms of the sequencing in which you may use other tools? Well, one of the things I think for a lot of all central banks that's changed, of course, in, in recent times is that we've had to look far more at the tools that we have available to us and there's more choice over tools. Whereas if you go back in time, obviously, it was all really a choice over, over rates, actually, over interest rates and how, what you did. It was a choice over one tool. Uh, and we've done that. I mean, we've had to look at uh, the, the role of forward guidance. We've had to look at the role of quantitative easing. And we are doing the work, obviously, on evaluating the, you know, whether, whether there would be a case and in what circumstances for, for using a negative rate. We don't have a sort of fixed order of use of tools, and I think that's appropriate. It would always be dependent upon the, the state of the world and the state of the economy that we found ourselves in. Have other tools been discussed? You mentioned three there. Um, QE, forward guidance, negative rates. Have other tools been discussed? Well, we do spend a, a lot of time discussing tools, actually, these days. Um, so, yes, we've discussed all of those tools. We've also you know, discussed how we would use them in particular circumstances. And let's just come back to this point about how they work in particular states of the world. Um, looking at the, at the economy, looking at the, uh, the report you've delivered today, um, questions are going to be asked, as they are being asked around the world, as to whether or not economies are going to suffer double dips. You've got a negative number in for Q4. I think you've got two and a half in for Q1. Yes. What is the risk of the downside on the latter number? What is the risk that that number undershoots? Well, I think it's a particular issue, of course, about the evolution of COVID itself. Uh, that's a, we, we've got a very substantial downside risk on the forecast, and a lot of that relates to how COVID itself is going to evolve. So I, I, I would emphasise that. Uh, the, the other thing I would emphasise about the sort of the path of, of, of GDP and activity in the economy is just, of course, to bear in mind that at the end of the third quarter, so at the end of September, relative to a level before COVID, so end of last year, last calendar year, the economy was about 9% down in terms of the level of activity. So when we think about the sort of the quarterly path, yeah. we have to overlay it on the fact, and these are huge numbers. I mean, you think in history, these are just unprecedented numbers. So that fall in Q4, of course, does come from a starting point that is much lower than it was pre-COVID. Trajectory is different. Yeah. Um, as a result, I, what do you see the biggest risk now lying ahead for the economy? You've mentioned COVID, but let's talk a little bit about Brexit. What assumptions are you making about Brexit right now? You're going with government guidance. Nevertheless, you have agents that are giving you information as well. What assumptions are you making about the preparedness of the British economy for Brexit come the start of next year? Yes. So we continue to condition and, and, and use in the forecast the view that there will be a trade agreement and that it will be... Uh, the trade agreement that the government has, has set out to get, I, I, that, that's, I think, uh, would, would obviously be a, an outcome we would all welcome. Um, and, and we continue to use that because you know, the, the, the negotiations and talks are obviously still going on. So, you know, actions speak for themselves in that sense. Now, what we've had to also look at, of course, is that any trade agreement, whatever it is, of course, involves the UK leaving the customs union, leaving the single market. So there is an adjustment process that goes on with that, and we have assumed in the forecast that that adjustment process would really work over the first two quarters of next year. 
So there will be an adjustment process. We've spent a lot of time, including work done by our regional agents, assessing what I might call the state of readiness. Uh, talked to a lot of firms. We've you know, formed a view on that uh, and applied that into the forecast. Broadly, the sort of the view we get back is that around about 70% on average of firms say, you know, they think they're they're ready. Um, large firms somewhat more ready than smaller firms, and the whole is our experience and what we get back from our agents and others. I, I should say a lot of the commentary that comes back is firms say, well, we're as ready as we can be, and of course you then have to interpret what what the words can be actually might mean. Now, I, the last point I'd make on this, and it's a very important one, of course, that it is asymmetric at the moment in the sense that the UK has said that it will only bring the, you know, the, the, the new sort of procedures and, 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 and regulations in and, really next summer actually so they'll, they'll be they'll it'll smooth the adjustment process at the moment the european union hasn't said that obviously if the trade agreement led to a sort of spirit of goodwill in which both were prepared to in a sense smooth the process of adjustment in that would obviously benefit and that would probably be an upside just returning to monetary policy um is there a danger that, that the MPC and the PRA are sending different messages at the moment? The MPC is pushing money into the economy. The PRA is telling banks, what's your risk? Well, I, I mean, those are in a sense reflect the different objectives, but we are very joined up uh, in doing this. And let me, I mean, let me bring in the third leg of our policy making world, which is the FPC, the Financial Policy Committee, the macro potential body, because we spent a lot of time stress testing the banking system. And the good news is, and this really is good news, that the banking system is, you know, is in good shape. It's stood up. You know, we've not had a banking crisis this year. Actually, you know, we've, got, we've got banks that are supporting the economy, which is exactly what we want them to do. And exactly why we, you know, globally we did all the reforms we did post-financial crisis, because this is the first big test of that. And it's, you know, it, it, it's gone, I think, you know, as well as we could have expected. The government is delivering extra stimulus to the economy on the fiscal channel. Can we just talk about the interplay a little bit between monetary policy and the, the fiscal channel? Um, you are making very clear at every opportunity when you are asked the question about monetary financing that that is something that, that the bank is not engaging with. However, I think there is a good argument to say that, that were you to stop delivering QE or a similar policy that there would be a destabilizing effect potentially on government finances. Does that mean the bank is effectively trapped at this point? Well, I, I've recognised, and we had many conversations going back to the spring on this, that we are, I mean, quantitative easing is the right policy to use. It's, 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 it's had a positive effect, and that's, that's for the good. Now, we're living in the sort of shock where the government is having to step forward and, in a sense, take the, take the, the strain through fiscal policy of the impact of COVID. And it's therefore natural, in a sense, that the effect of quantitative easing terms of the effect on rates will work through the, you know, the, the, the biggest borrower in the economy, which is currently the, currently the government, but it's also going through to other borrowers, particularly, particularly corporates and households. And, and that's, that's not surprising. I mean, we're not insulated. You know, we don't insulate the government from the effects of monetary policy in that sense. I mean, they, you know, in a sense, the benefit goes through that channel because it reduces the cost of government borrowing, but it reduces the cost of everybody else's borrowing as well. So that's natural. So I don't, I don't, you know, don't have any problem from the point of view of you know, what used to be called fiscal dominance. That's not fiscal dominance. Uh, just a final quick question. Um, what is your assessment of equivalence right now? What is your view of what kind of equivalence the City of London, the financial sector here, might be able to enjoy or not enjoy? Well, let me say, first of all, one of the very welcome things that has been agreed recently is the uh, agreement that there will be uh, equivalents for, uh, for, for, for central clearing and that that will go on for another period of time. I think that's right. I, I'm a very strong supporter of free trade and open economies, and that's true of financial services as much as, uh, as, much as every other aspect of the economy. Um, I think it would be you know, in the best interest of everybody if we come to an agreement on it. But let me say this about, you know, about, about the UK uh, and the City of London. You know, we're a global financial centre, uh, and that's going to go on. Uh, and I would think that it's in the best interests of um, parties in the European Union to have access to that rather than to deny themselves access. Governor, thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you.